The Elephant Island Chronicles Presence Simon Starts in the World by J.J. Hooper Forward by Geo Marin Narration by Eleven Labs Forward In a world where the boundaries of our familiar environments often feel like the edges of our existence, Simon Starts in the World by J.J. Hooper presents a narrative steeped in the realities of rural life and the rebellious spirit of youth. This compelling tale goes beyond the simple story of a young boy stepping into adulthood. It is a robust portrayal of the challenges and adventures that come with breaking free from the constraints of a strict and often unforgiving upbringing. From the very first page, we are introduced to Simon, a character whose sharp wit and unyielding desire for independence resonate deeply with all who have ever challenged authority. His journey is not merely a physical trek through the varied landscapes of Middle Georgia, but a profound expedition into the heart of life's many moral and ethical dilemmas. Each challenge Simon faces, each mischievous act, and each lesson he learns mirrors our own potential for growth and understanding amidst adversity. J.J. Hooper's masterful storytelling is both engaging and evocative, capturing the essence of what it means to rebel against and reconcile with the expectations of family and society. The richly detailed settings and the vibrant characters Simon encounters along the way are brought to life with a narrative style that is both humorous and thought-provoking. This story speaks to the spirit of resilience and the quest for identity reminding us of the complexities and wonders that await those who dare to challenge the status quo. Simon Starts in the World is more than just a tale for the young. It reminds readers of all ages that the world is full of marvels and trials waiting to be discovered and navigated. Simon's courage, cunning, and curiosity reflect our own desires to break free from the constraints of the familiar and seek out the extraordinary. As you embark on this journey with Simon, may you find inspiration in his adventures and rediscover the joy of exploring new horizons, even those fraught with challenges. Whether you are young in years or young at heart, this story is a timeless celebration of the human spirit's unquenchable thirst for discovery and growth. Welcome to Simon's World. May his adventures ignite your curiosity and encourage you to step boldly into the unknown. Geo Maron, Simon Starts in the World, by J.J. Hooper Until Simon entered his seventeenth year, he lived with his father, an old hard-shell Baptist preacher, who, though very pious and remarkably austere, was very avaricious. The old man reared his boy, or endeavored to do so, according to the strictest requisitions of the moral law. But he lived, at the time to which we refer, in Middle Georgia, which was then newly settled. And Simon, whose wits were always too sharp for his father's, contrived to contract all the coarse vices incident to such a region. He stole his mother's roosters to fight them at Bob Smith's grocery, and his father's plow horses to enter them in quarter matches at the same place. He pitched dollars with Bob Smith himself and could beat him into doll rags whenever it came to a measurement. To crown his accomplishments, Simon was tip-top at the game of Old Sledge, which was the fashionable game of that era and was early initiated in the mysteries of stocking the papers. The vicious habits of Simon were, of course, a sore trouble to his father, Elder Jedediah. He reasoned, he counseled, he remonstrated, and he lashed. But Simon was an incorrigible, irreclaimable devil. One day the simple-minded old man returned rather unexpectedly to the field, where he had left Simon and Ben and a negro boy named Bill at work. Ben was still following his plow, but Simon and Bill were in a fence corner very earnestly engaged at seven-up. Of course, the game was instantly suspended as soon as they spied the old man, sixty or seventy yards off, striding towards them. 
It was evidently a gone case with Simon and Bill, but our hero determined to make the best of it. Putting the cards into one pocket, he coolly picked up the small coins which constituted the stake and fobbed them in the other, remarking, Well, Bill, this game's blocked. We'd as well quit. <laughs> but Mass Simon, remarked the boy, half dat money's mine. Ain't you gwine to lemme hab em? Oh, never mind the money, Bill. The old man's going to take the bark off both of us. And besides, with the hand I held when we quit, I should have beat you and won it all anyway. Well, but Mass Simon, we never finished a game, and de rule. Go to the devil with your rule, said the impatient Simon. Don't you see daddy's right down upon us, with an arm full of hickories? I tell you, I held nothing but trumps, and could have beat the horns off a billy goat. Don't that satisfy you? Somehow or another, you're d hard to please. About this time, a thought struck Simon, and in a low tone, for by this time the Reverend Jedediah was close at hand, he continued, But maybe Daddy don't know, right down sure, what we've been doing. Let's try him with a lie. Twon't hurt, no way. Let's tell him we've been playing mumble peg. Bill was perforce compelled to submit to this inequitable adjustment of his claim to a share of the stakes, and of course agreed to swear to the game of mumble peg. All this was settled, and a pig driven into the ground slyly and hurriedly between Simon's legs as he sat on the ground just as the old man reached the spot. He carried under his left arm several neatly trimmed sprouts of formidable length, while in his left hand he held one which he was intently engaged in divesting of its superfluous twigs. So ho, youngsters! You in the fence corner and the crap in the grass! What saith the scripter, Simon? Go to the ant, thou sluggard! And so forth and so on. What in the round creation of the earth have you and that nigger been a-doin? Bill shook with fear, but Simon was cool as a cucumber, and answered his father to the effect that they had been wasting a little time in the game of mumblepeg. Mumblepeg! Mumblepeg! repeated old Mr. Suggs. What's that? Simon explained the process of rooting for the peg, how the operator got upon his knees, keeping his arms stiff by his sides, leaned forward and extracted the peg with his teeth. So you get upon your knees, do you? to pull up that nasty little stick. You'd better get upon him to ask mercy for your sinful souls and for a dying world. But let's see, one of you get the peg up now. The first impulse of our hero was to volunteer to gratify the curiosity of his worthy sire, but a glance at the old man's countenance changed his notion, and he remarked that Bill was a long ways the best hand. Bill who did not deem Simon's modesty an omen very favorable to himself, was inclined to reciprocate, compliments with his young master, but a gesture of impatience from the old man set him instantly upon his knees, and, bending forward, he essayed to lay hold with his teeth of the peg, which Simon, just at that moment, very wickedly pushed a half-inch further down. Just as the breeches and hide of the boy were stretched to the uttermost, old Mr. Suggs brought down his longest hickory, with both hands, upon the precise spot where the tension was greatest. With a loud yell, Bill plunged forward, upsetting Simon, and rolled in the grass, rubbing the castigated part with fearful energy. Simon, though overthrown, was unhurt and he was mentally complimenting himself upon the sagacity which had prevented his illustrating the game of mumblepeg for the paternal amusement, when his attention was arrested by the old man's stooping to pick up something. What is it? A card upon which Simon had been sitting, and which, therefore, had not gone with the rest of the pack into his pocket. The simple Mr. Suggs had only a vague idea of the pasteboard abomination called cards and though he decidedly inclined to the opinion that this was one, 
he was by no means certain of the fact. Had Simon known this, he would certainly have escaped, but he did not. His father, assuming the look of extreme sapiency, which is always worn by the interrogator who does not desire or expect to increase his knowledge by his questions, asked, What's this, Simon? The Jacodimunts, promptly responded Simon, who gave up all as lost after this faux pas. What was it doing down thar, Simon, my sonny? continued Mr. Suggs in an ironically affectionate tone of voice. I had it under my leg thar to make it on Bill. The first time it come trumps, was the ready reply. What's trumps? asked Mr. Suggs, with a view of arriving at the import of the word. Nothing ain't trumps now, said Simon, who misapprehended his father's meaning, but clubs was when you come along and busted up the game. A part of this answer was Greek to the Reverend Mr. Suggs, but a portion of it was full of meaning. They had then most unquestionably been throwing cards, the scoundrels, the audacious little hellions. To the mulberry with both on you, in a hurry, said the old man sternly. But the lads were not disposed to be in a hurry for the mulberry was the scene of all formal punishment administered during work hours in the field. Simon followed his father, however, but made, as he went along, all manner of faces at the old man's back, gesticulated as if he were going to strike him between the shoulders with his fists, and kicking at him so as almost to touch his coat-tail with his shoe. In this style they walked on to the mulberry tree in whose shade Simon's brother Ben was resting. It must not be supposed that, during the walk to the place of punishment, Simon's mind was either inactive or engaged in suggesting the grimaces and contortions wherewith he was pantomimically expressing his irreverent sentiments toward his father. Far from it. The movements of his limbs and features were the mere workings of habit, the self-grinding of the corporeal machine for which his reasoning half was only remotely responsible. For while Simon's person was thus, on its own account, making game of old Jediah, his wits, in view of the anticipated flogging, were dashing, springing, bounding, darting about, in hot chase of some expedient suitable to the necessities of the case, much after the manner in which Puss, when Betty, armed with the broom and hotly seeking vengeance for pantry robbed or bed defiled, has closed upon her the garret doors and windows, attempts all sorts of impossible exits to come down at last in the corner, with panting side and glaring eye, exhausted and defenseless. Our unfortunate hero could devise nothing by which he could reasonably expect to escape the heavy blows of his father. Having arrived at this conclusion and the mulberry about the same time, he stood with a dogged look, awaiting the issue. The old man Suggs made no remark to anyone while he was sizing up Bill, a process which, though by no means novel to Simon, seemed to excite in him a sort of painful interest. He watched it closely, as if endeavoring to learn the precise fashion of his father's knot and when at last Bill was swung up a tiptoe to a limb, and the whipping commenced, Simon's eye followed every movement of his father's arm, and as each blow descended upon the bare shoulders of his sable friend, his own body writhed and wriggled in involuntary sympathy. It's the devil it is, said Simon to himself, to take such a wallopin' as that. Why, the old man looks like he wants to get to the holler if he could. Rot his old picter. It's worth, at the least, fifty cents. Gee, a mini, how that hurt. Yes, it's worth three quarters of a dollar to take that ear lickin'. Wonder if I'm predestinated, as old Jediah says, to get the feller to it. Lord, how daddy blows. I do wish to God he'd bust wide open the derned old dear face. If twan't for Ben helpin' him... I believe I'd give the old dog a tussle when it comes to my turn. It couldn't make the thing no wuss, if it didn't make it no better. Drot it! 
What do boys have daddies for, anyhow? Taint for nothing but just to beat em and work em. There's some use in mammies. I can poke my finger right in the old omen's eye and keep it thar. And if I say it ain't thar, she'll say so, too. I wish she was here to hold daddy off. If twan't so fur, I'd holler for her, anyhow. How she would cling to the old fellow's coattail. Mr. Jedediah Suggs let down Bill and untied him. Approaching Simon, whose coat was off. Come, Simon, son, said he. Cross them hands. I'm gwine to correct you. It ain't no use, Daddy, said Simon. Why so, Simon? Just because it ain't. I'm gwine to play cards as long as I live. When I go off to myself, I'm gwine to make my living by it. So what's the use of beating me about it? Old Mr. Suggs groaned, as he was wont to do in the pulpit, at this display of Simon's viciousness. Simon, said he, you're a poor ignorant creature. You don't know nothing, and you've never been nowheres. If I was to turn you off, you'd starve in a week. I wish you'd try me, said Simon, and just see. I'd win more money in a week than you can make in a year. There ain't nobody round here can make seed corn off of me at cards. I'm rail smart, he added, with great emphasis. Simon, Simon, you poor unlettered fool, don't you know that all card players and chicken fighters and horse racers go to hell? You crack-brained creature, you. And don't you know that them that plays cards always loses their money, and... Who wins it all, then, Daddy? asked Simon. Shut your mouth, you impertinent slack-jawed dog. Your daddies are trying to give you some good advice, and you are picking up his words that way. I knowed a young man once, when I lived in Oglethorpe, as went down to Augusty and sold a hundred dollars' worth of cotton for his daddy. And some of them gamblers got him to drinkin', and the very first night he was with them, they got every cent of his money. They couldn't get my money in a week, said Simon. Anybody can get these here Greenfeller's money. Them's the sort I'm a gween to watch for myself. Here's what can fix the papers just about as nice as anybody. Well, it's no use to argify about the matter, said old Jediah. What saith the scripture? He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow. Hence, Simon, you're a poor Miss Ubble fool, so cross your hands. You just as well not, Daddy. I tell you I'm going to follow playing cards for a livin', and what's the use of banging a feller about it? I'm as smart as any of em, and Bob Smith says them Augusty fellers can't make rent off of me. The Reverend Mr. Suggs had once in his life gone to Augusta, an extent of travel which, in those days, was a little unusual. His consideration among his neighbors was considerably increased by the circumstance, as he had all the benefit of the popular inference that no man could visit the city of Augusta without acquiring a vast superiority over all his untraveled neighbors in every department of human knowledge. Mr. Suggs then, very naturally, felt ineffably indignant that an individual who had never seen any collection of human habitations larger than a log house village, an individual, in short, no other or better than Bob Smith, should venture to express an opinion concerning the manners, customs, or anything else appertaining to, or in any wise connected with, the Ultima Thule of backwoods Georgians. There were two propositions which witnessed their own truth to the mind of Mr. Suggs. The one was that a man who had never been at Augusta could not know anything about that city, or any place, or anything else. The other, that one who had been there must of necessity be not only well informed as to all things connected with the city itself, but perfectly au fait upon all subjects whatsoever. It was therefore in a tone of mingled indignation and contempt that he replied to the last remark of Simon. Bob Smith says, does he? 
And who's Bob Smith? Much does Bob Smith know about Augusty. He's been thar, I reckon. Slipped off yearly some mornin', when nobody weren't noticin', and got back a fortnight. It's only a hundred and fifty mile. Oh, yes, Bob Smith knows all about it. I don't know nothing about it. I ain't never been to Augusty. I couldn't find the road thar, I reckon. Ha, ha, Bob, Smythe. If he was only to see one of them fine gentlemen in Augusty, with his fine broadcloth and bell crown hat, and shoe boots a shining like silver, he'd take to the woods and kill himself a running. Bob Smith, that's where all your devilment comes from, Simon. Bob Smith's as good as anybody else, I judge, and a heap smarter than some. He showed me how to cut Jack, continued Simon, and that's more nor some people can do if they have been to Augusty. If Bob Smith can do it, said the old man, I kin too. I don't know it by that name, but if it's book knowledge or plain sense, and Bob kin do it, it's reasonable to suppose that old Jediah Suggs won't be bothered bad. Is it anyways similiar to the rule of three, Simon? Pretty similiar, Daddy, but not exactly, said Simon, drawing a pack from his pocket to explain. Now, Daddy, he proceeded, you see, these here four cards is what we call the jacks. Well, now, the idea is, if you'll take the pack and mix them all up together, I'll take off a passel from the top, and the bottom one of them I take off will be one of the jacks. Me to mix em fust, said old Jediah. Yes. And you not to see but the back of the top one when you go to cut, as you call it. Just so, Daddy. And the back's all just as like as kin be, said the senior Suggs, examining the cards. More alike nor cow peas, said Simon. It can't be done, Simon, observed the old man with great solemnity. Bob Smith kind do it, and so kin I. It's again nater, Simon. There ain't a man in Augusty, nor on top of the earth, that kin do it. Daddy, said our hero, if you'll bet me. What? thundered old Mr. Suggs. Bet, did you says? And he came down with a scorer across Simon's shoulders. Me, Jed Dia Suggs, that's been in the Lord's service these twenty years. Me bet, you nasty, sassy, trifling, ugly. I didn't go to say that, Daddy. That weren't what I meant exactly. I went to say that E.F., you'd let me off from this hermolin you owe me and give me bunch if I cut Jack. I'd give you all this here silver if I didn't. That's all. To be sure, I allers knowed you wouldn't bet. Old Mr. Suggs ascertained the exact amount of the silver which his son handed him in an old leathern pouch for inspection. He also, mentally, compared that sum with an imaginary one, the supposed value of a certain Indian pony called Bunch, which he had bought for his old woman's Sunday riding, and which had sent the old lady into a fence corner the first and only time she ever mounted him. As he weighed the pouch of silver in his hand, Mr. Suggs also endeavored to analyze the character of the transaction proposed by Simon. It certainly can't be nothing but given. No way it can be twisted, he murmured to himself. I know he can't do it, so there's no risk. What makes betting? The risk. It's a one-sided business, and I'll just let him give me all his money, and that'll put all his wild sportin' notions out of his head. Will you stand it, Daddy? asked Simon, by way of waking the old man up. You mought as well, for the whippin' won't do you no good. And as for Bunch, nobody about the plantation won't ride him but me. Simon, replied the old man, I agree to it. Your old daddy is in a close place about payin' for his land. And this here money, it's just eleven dollars, lacking of twenty-five cents, will help out mightily. But mind, Simon, E.F., 
anything said about this hereafter. Remember, you give me the money. Very well, Daddy. And EF, the thing works up instead of down. I suppose we'll say you give me bunch, eh? You won't never be troubled to tell how you come by bunch. The thing's again nader and can't be done. What old Jedi a Suggs knows, he knows as good as anybody. Give me them fixments, Simon. Ooh. Our hero handed the cards to his father, who, dropping the plow line with which he had intended to tie Simon's hands, turned his back to that individual in order to prevent his witnessing the operation of mixing. He then sat down and very leisurely commenced shuffling the cards, making, however, an exceedingly awkward job of it. Restive kings and queens jumped from his hands, or obstinately refused to slide into the company of the rest of the pack. Occasionally, a sprightly knave would insist on facing his neighbor, or, pressing his edge against another's, half double himself up, and then skip away. But Elder Jediah perseveringly continued his attempts to subdue the refractory, while heavy drops burst from his forehead and ran down his cheeks. All of a sudden, an idea, quick and penetrating as a rifle ball, seemed to have entered the cranium of the old man. He chuckled audibly. The devil had suggested to Mr. Suggs an impromptu stock, which would place the chances of Simon, already sufficiently slim in the old man's opinion, without the range of possibility. Mr. Suggs forthwith proceeded to cut all the picter ones so as to be certain to include the jacks and place them at the bottom, with the evident intention of keeping Simon's fingers above these when he should cut. Our hero, who was quietly looking over his father's shoulders all the time, did not seem alarmed by this disposition of the cards. On the contrary, he smiled, as if he felt perfectly confident of success in spite of it. Now, Daddy, said Simon, when his father had announced himself ready, Nary one of us ain't got to look at the cards while I'm a-cuttin'. If we do, it'll spile the conjuration. Very well. And another thing, you've got to look me right dead in the eye, Daddy. Will you? To be sure. To be sure, said Mr. Suggs. Fire away. Simon walked up close to his father and placed his hand on the pack. Old Mr. Suggs looked in Simon's eye, and Simon returned the look for about three seconds, during which a close observer might have detected a suspicious working of the wrist of the hand on the cards. But the elder Suggs did not remark it. Wake snakes! Days are breaking! Rise, Jack! said Simon, cutting half a dozen cards from the top of the pack and presenting the face of the bottom one for the inspection of his father. It was the Jack of Hearts. Old Mr. Suggs staggered back several steps, with uplifted eyes and hands. Merciful master, he exclaimed. F the boy hain't. Well, how in the round creation of the... Ben, did you ever? To be sure and sartain, Satan has power on this earth. And Mr. Suggs groaned in very bitterness. You never seed nothing like that in Augusty, did you, Daddy? asked Simon, with a malicious wink at Ben. Simon, how did you do it? queried the old man, without noticing his son's question. Do it, Daddy, do it. Taint nothing. I done it just as easy as shootin'. Whether this explanation was entirely, or in any degree satisfactory, to the perplexed mind of Elder Jediah Suggs, cannot, after the lapse of the time which has intervened, be sufficiently ascertained. It is certain, however, that he pressed the investigation no farther, but merely requested his son Benjamin to witness the fact that, in consideration of his love and affection for his son Simon, and in order to furnish the Doni with the means of leaving that portion of the state of Georgia, he bestowed upon him the impracticable pony, Bunch. Just so, Daddy, just so, I'll witness that. 
but it reminds me mightily of the way Mammy give old trailer the side of bacon last week. She is sweeping up the hearth, the meat on the table. Old trailer jumps up, gathers the bacon, and darts. Mammy arter him with the broomstick as fur as the door, but seeing the dog has got the start, she shakes the stick at him and hollers, You sassy, eye-zookin, roguish, natty, flop-eared varmint. Take it along, take it along. I only wish twas full of ice-nick and ox-vomit and blue vitrule, so as twould cut your enterals into chitlins. That's about the way you give bunch to Simon. <sighs> oh, sure, Ben, remarked Simon. I wouldn't run on that way. Daddy couldn't help it. It was predestinated. Whom he hath, he will, you know. And the rascal pulled down the underlid of his left eye at his brother. Then, addressing his father, he asked, Warn't it, Daddy? I want so. To be sure, to be sure, all fixed aforehand, was old Mr. Sugg's reply. Didn't I tell you so, Ben? said Simon. I knowed it was all fixed aforehand. And he laughed until he was purple in the face. What's in ye? What are you laughing about? asked the old man wrathily. Oh, it's so funny that it could all have been fixed aforehand, said Simon, and laughed louder than before. The obtusity of the Reverend Mr. Suggs, however, prevented his making any discoveries. He fell into a brown study, and no further allusion was made to the matter. It was evident to our hero that his father intended he should remain but one more night beneath the paternal roof. What mattered it to Simon? He went home at night, curried and fed Bunch, whispered confidentially in his ear that he was the fastest piece of hossflesh, according to size, that ever shaded the earth, and then busied himself in preparing for an early start on the morrow. Old Mr. Sugg's big red rooster had hardly ceased crowing in announcement of the coming dawn, when Simon mounted the intractable bunch. Both were in high spirits, our hero at the idea of unrestrained license in future, and bunch from a mesmerical transmission to himself of a portion of his master's deviltry. Simon raised himself in the stirrups, yelled a tolerably fair imitation of the creek war whoop, and shouted, I'm off, old stud. Remember the jack of hearts. Bunch shook his little head, tucked down his tail, ran sideways as if going to fall, and then suddenly reared, squealed, and struck off at a brisk gallop. The end. From all of us here at the Elephant Island Chronicles, we hope you have enjoyed this classic short story by J.J. Hooper. Until next time. Stay curious.